Uh, welcome to everybody who's out there and people who are joining. We're going to give um, a couple of minutes extra for people to join uh, for the seventh lecture in the IAG Bread series on education. Um, so at 1002, we will uh, start the lecture officially. Uh, but a big welcome to all of you who are out there and wherever you are. Uh, hope you're safe and well, um, and we're looking forward to uh, this lecture. Okay, uh, let's get started. So this is lecture seven in the series on education uh, for the IEG Bread course. And this is part one of two lectures on education markets. My name is Jishnu Das. I'm a professor at Georgetown University and NBR and the, and the Center for Policy Research in New Delhi. And this lecture, which is part one of a two part series on education market, uh, is joined with Asim Khwaja, who is on uh, the call, but you won't see him. Uh, it is based on joint work with Bahir Andrabi at Pomona College, Natalie Bao at UCLA, Asim Khwaja at Harvard, and Noreen Karachiwala, who is at IFPRI. Just a few preliminaries before we start. Uh, the slides accompany lecture seven of the education module, and they're best viewed together with the lecture. This is going to be part one of a two part lecture, as I said before, and we are going to have a lot of slides. Uh, some of them are going to be marked with a double star, which means they're technical. Uh, that's partly there so that you can return to these slides whenever you like, work through them or use them as references. Uh, 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 so I, there are many slides I will not get through and you should feel free to come back, uh, look at them and see um, how you want to use them. Two more things. This is uh, going to be updated. So this is version one dated 2-17-2022. And I will update them by the end of May. Uh, you should be able to download the latest versions at this time. Uh, and at that time, you will also have access to papers discussed in the slides, which are not accessible right now from the LEAPS website to which the slides will contain a link. And LEAPS is the Learning and Educational Achievement in Pakistan study, which I will reference quite often in the, um, in the slides. From there, you'll also be able to download data and additional instructional resources. Uh, and throughout the slide presentation, I will hyperlink to the papers discussed here, which makes it easy for you to find them. And these hyperlinks will be updated by the end of May. Okay, let's get started. What are we gonna cover in this lecture? The main idea that we're going to work with is that many children in low-income countries now live in settings with substantial school choice. And I'll show you what that means, but we are going to call these education markets. The presence of education markets means that parents and children choose what schools to go to. It's not the case that you're in a place where there's only one school or you have to walk a long distance to school. In fact, the reality for many parents and children is there are multiple schools around them and they have to choose which schools to attend. In return, schools choose to respond to parental demand, both in what they offer and in the case of private schools, which are becoming an increasingly important part of the landscape, they have to think about what fees to charge. What we'll do in this lecture is discuss what this environment looks like in terms of schooling options. 
And I'll show you how the lens of education market changes how we think of key policy and research questions. Then Asim will return in the next lecture to look at how once we use this lens of education market, we have a different way of thinking about how to improve outcomes for children. Uh, before diving into the material, I'm going to start with a brief aside on the broader picture of education in low-income countries. And the view from 30,000 feet is really the following. Here's a quote from a very uh, uh, important book by Jonathan Kozel, who is a writer in the United States. It's called Illiterate America, and it's written in 1985. And he says 25 million adults cannot read the poison warnings on a can of pesticide, a letter from the child's teacher, or the front page of a daily paper. An additional 35 million read only at a level less than equal to the full survival needs of a society. Together, these 60 million people represent more than one third of the entire adult population. So two things here. One is, it is devastating to be illiterate in a society where literacy is assumed and almost everything around you, whether it's street signs, whether it's how to function, depends upon your being illiterate, or uh, depends on your being literate. Second, this is the United States. And in fact, if you Google something like functional literacy in the United States or functional illiteracy in the United States, you'll see it's just as high today as it was when Kozul was writing almost 40 years ago. So in a lot of countries, a sizable fractions of the population cannot read or do basic math required to function in society. And we need to be aware that that is a huge human and psychological cost that we are imposing that people face in their everyday lives. The second point I want to make is it's not that countries are standing still. Although countries are reforming constantly and spending more money on education, quality of schooling has been very hard to improve. And I'll show you a slide on that. The third one, and Karthik hinted at that a little bit in his, in his first lecture, is actually when you look at low-income countries, they have done exceptionally well compared to today's high-income countries and have recovered from the destruction of their schooling systems under colonial regimes in record time. Let me show you three slides that make that point. You know, the first slide, Michael Clemens, who's at the Center for Global Development, has a wonderful paper on the historical experience of enrollment increases around the world. And this is what he shows. So what is he trying to do here? He's trying to say, well, let's consider, uh, let's consider for a moment, uh, putting all countries on the same historical scale. So what is the zero? The zero is the point at which 50% of children are in primary enrollment, right? What does that mean in reality? Well, about 30% of children under 15 are enrolled in school because children under five are typically not enrolled. They might be delayed enrollment, right? And then he puts all countries on that same scale. He says, how long does it take to move from a certain fraction of children in enrollment to a higher fraction of children in enrollment, right? And he says the following, from 50% to 70%, it takes around 22 years. From 70 to 80, it takes around 36 years. And from 80 to 90, it took around 58 years in the past. Shouldn't be a surprise that these numbers are going up because as you get towards higher numbers, the people who remain are harder to bring into school. Perhaps they're living in very remote areas. Perhaps their circumstances are very difficult. Now let's look at the experience of low-income countries. And I'll give you three examples because this is our aside and we must get into the major material of the course very shortly. Example one is Burkina Faso. And when I was at the World Bank uh, before moving to Georgetown, Burkina Faso was thought to be a country that was severely off track in meeting what were the Millennium Development Goal targets for 2015. It had a 36% net enrollment rate in 2000 and its expected net enrollment in 2015 was 59%, which was going to make it still short of the MDG targets. But let's take a step back and say, look, 
given the historical enrollment, what's realistic, right? So if it were growing at a 19th century transition rate, we would have expected its enrollment to be 45%. At the typical post-1950 rate, it would have been 49.4%. Where was it actually? 69% in 2015 and 78% in 2018. So a country like Burkina Faso is you know, overshooting expectations and the historical transitions uh, by a huge amount. And that turns out to be not only true for Burkina Faso, it turns out to be true for a number of other, other countries. And you can look at Clement's paper and you can make these computations yourself by going to say our world in data, picking up some data and looking at these transitions. That's really a useful exercise to get you know, your hand around. Second example, Zimbabwe, right? Zimbabwe gets, gets, gets independence only in 1980. So this improvement that we are seeing, this rapid rise in, in enrollment that we are seeing is even more remarkable when we realize that many countries received their independence from colonial rule only in the last 70 years. And once they did, they invested heavily in education. So, Prashant Bharadwaj at UCSD and Karen Grepin at NYU have looked at the experience of Zimbabwe. And again, you know, whenever you see this blue thing and there's a line, it's hyperlinked. So go to the slides and you can just click on the hyperlink and it'll take you to the paper. Uh, and here's what they show, right? So they're, they're interested in what's the link between schooling and health. Uh, but, you know, the numbers themselves are so fascinating that it, it's worth a look. Here's where, the, the age of children in their survey, uh, the demographic and health survey uh, is in 1980, right? And the point is, so they're excluding children who are 14 to 15. And the point they're trying to make is if you were too old to go to secondary school, only 20% of kids went, went to secondary school if they were too old by the time independence rolled around. But if you were not too old, if you were still eligible, you could have gone in, you were younger, well, the fraction going to secondary school went up to 50%, right? So huge increase in years of schooling just with independence in Zimbabwe. And when you think about this for a country like India, where historians have tried to assemble data for say the Madras presidency, their best estimates suggest that the presidency was more illiterate in 1930, 100 years later than it used to be in 1820, and in fact, in 1825, the state of education in Madras was significantly better than England in 1800. You'll find it fascinating. And this is a, this is a book you can actually just download on the internet by the historian Dharampal, who says the major issue that they face as historians is trying to understand why the British came in and destroyed an education system. And he says, the main reason for this lay in the fact that the British society of this period had few interests in education. They were introverted by nature. And then he reassures the reader, it's not that Britain had no tradition of education at all, at least compared to a country like India, but it's just that their learning and scholarship was limited to a very select elite, right? So you have to switch your mind and say, well, look, you know, a country like India was colonized by a group of people who were, you know, potentially less literate than the population that they, that they colonized. Right? So India had this huge task after independence to remake an education system that had been significantly undermined in the previous 150 years. And that's the view I wanted to keep in mind. And where we want to think now is to say, where are we now? Right? And the story you've heard in the last, in, in, in a bunch of lectures and that you should be fairly familiar with is that enrollments have increased, but learning is lagging behind. And what I want to focus in this lecture is the fact that average learning is learning lagging behind doesn't mean that every child is doing poorly. In fact, if you look at the histogram, so what I've done here is plotted test scores for young adults. And these are scores that we have collected. We have tested these, these young adults. They're age 21 to 26 in the LEAPS uh, uh, data. Some of them are doing very poorly. So all of these children, and these are the numbers, all of these people, these young adults actually can't count or read the alphabet. But these kids can, 
they can do a lot more. They can do complex fractions, they can read passages, they can answer questions. Uh, and we find exactly the same patterns for functional skills like buying vegetables, paying electric bills, or, or reading text messages. Uh, and that's here, you can look at it later. So what's driving this variation? One answer, very clear answer is the longer they have been in school, which is what I'm plotting here, the better are their test scores and the better are their life skills, these functional skills we are talking about. Now you might say, oh, that's because of selection. We have heard a lot about selection and the children who continue in school are fast learners and would have learned all this naturally. That has nothing to do with schooling. And we have looked at this in this paper with Natalie Bao and Andre Xi Chang. And we showed that, look, in the LEAPS data, it is a lot of children drop out, but it turns out that their test score trajectories, which is what's the change from here to here, and then what's the change from here to here, is the same whether you dropped out or didn't drop out. But then the year they drop out, they're learning flat lines while those who remain in school go on. Right? This is, you know, it, it's not, it, it's not the, the, the final evidence, and there'll be more work on this, but it's very likely that a lot of these learning differences we are seeing comes from differences in schooling years. Uh, uh, and in fact, with COVID, this whole uh, you know, concern about what's going to happen, right? What should happen with uh, school closures is suggesting that children are getting something substantial in our schools. So what are the next steps? So we have to now start asking, can we create the institutions and ecosystems that spur innovation in order to speed up learning and improve productivity. And I want to tell you one thing, which is, which is that this is not an easy task. It's high stakes for the following reason. We have to remind ourselves that there are no obvious lessons to be drawn from high income countries. What do I mean by that? Well, here, you know, I've drawn Tesco's in the United States from 1971 to now. And it turns out that on, you know, for people who are age 17, it's been pretty much flat. There's been no increase at all. Now there are complicated reasons that people have dived into it. I mean, there are issues about composition, there are issues about different groups, uh, but the overall story is one of lack of improvement. And Caroline Hawksby has this wonderful paper where she shows that, you know, in fact, over the same time, the cost of schooling has gone up. So if you think of productivity and you say, how much is it costing us in the US to get a dollars, uh, a, a certain amount of test scores, that productivity has plummeted over this time. So we have a huge challenge in front of us. We have been doing in low income countries, we have been doing fairly well, but we now need to do more. And this will be a good time to start, stop, with you know, stop and ask and think about some questions that have come up. Uh, and when we return, we're going to dive into the main material of, of this particular course. Okay, so um, let's now go into thinking about, so this is a good time to uh, uh, ask questions. And Padmaja asks about the LEAP setting. Uh, I am gonna go into that right away uh, in, this, in this next phase. Okay. So what is it that we're gonna talk about? Wait, give me a second to take a sip of tea before my voice dries up. What is the context that we are going to talk about, right? It's going to be Pakistan. And within Pakistan, we're going to focus on the province of Punjab. Uh, it's the largest province in Pakistan with a population of about 100 million. And by some measures, its schooling system is the 12th largest in the world. So we're not talking about you know, a small schooling system. We're talking about a huge schooling system, 14 million children enrolled just in public schools. Punjab has also been a hub of school reform. There's a very nice article in The Economist 
uh, uh, that summarizes these kind of reforms. And the LEAPS data is the largest panel data on learning and schools in a low-income country. It was collected by myself, Asim Kwaja, who's on, on this course, and Tahir and Rabi, and it runs from 2003 to 2018. Uh, there is a provisional website and we're building a new one where the data will be available from at least uh, very shortly from 2003 to 2011. Uh, and there's a large volume of research partly coming from our involvement and partly from uh, other people who have been working in this, in this space. Uh, so here are three, four things you should know about this landscape, which for people who are coming from India, this will be very, very, uh, 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 familiar. Okay. It will be a very, very familiar environment. Uh, there are many different types of institutions, right? So there are roughly 191,000, sorry, uh, 191,000 uh, uh, public institutions, right? But there are also 112,000 private institutions. And roughly equivalent, you know, a 60-40 ratio in the enrollment breakdowns. What are these private institutions? Well, if you look at these private schools, they have really shot up. There's a really nice paper, you know, written in 19 uh, 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 in 1980 on private schools in Pakistan, where they counted something like 3,000 and expected it to rise to something like 10,000 as a maximum. What actually happened? There were 32,000 in 1990, 47,000 in 2005, 66,000 in 2016. And for those who think this is only an urban phenomenon, it's actually exactly the opposite. If you look at how they have set up, the blue here is rural schools. Rural schools are the majority of the new schools that are coming up in, in, in this setting. What are these private schools? Well, they're not elite either. So the way to think about this environment is their public schools who are all free, right? They charge a small admission fee. And there are these private schools that charge prices that they determine, right? Except for, you know, really at the top echelon where there's been worry about fee gouging and the courts have come in. There's little to no regulation or subsidy during the time of the LEAP study. What does that mean? That means about 40% of all uh, 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 enrollment is in private schools whose fees are less than rupees 400 per month. Uh, sorry, 400 per year, right? That's about $4. Okay. Then there are some, about 30, a third of children are in this bracket with schools with, with fees between 400 and 600. And very few, only about 10% are in this top bracket of rupees uh, fees greater than 800. Right? We have a paper called a dime a day where we say, look, these schools are really, really cheap on, on, on average. And what does this mean? So, you know, when people think about the leap, so they think about these private schools, they say, think, oh, this is about private schools. It's not. The key issue that I want to show you is that this is not about private schools, it is about choice. So this is a village in the, in the district of Faslabad, uh, uh, which is in central Punjab. And it's a village that I've actually been to uh, uh, several times. And some, you know, I've visited a lot of the villages and it's a village where if I walk from this corner to that corner, it takes me about 10 minutes walking with children. Right? So it's not a huge village. But now just think about how many schools there are in this village. There are five public schools, oh, sorry, five uh, private schools, right? And then there are two public schools. So when you think about say this household here, they're thinking, where should I send my child? Should I send my child here, 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 maybe here? Or should I send my child to the public school or here? Or should I send them to the public school here? And maybe, the, 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 the schools are thinking, oh, these parents have so much choice. How do I make my school stand out? Right? So the rise of private schools combined with the focus on equity that led to substantial investments in public school construction 
has fundamentally changed the schooling environment. More than 70% of the children in rural Punjab now live in areas where they can access multiple schools within a walking distance. This is also true for other countries in South Asia and urban Africa, but not necessarily rural parts of other countries. And one thing to think about as you're embarking on your research careers is we need a lot of information from other countries, other contexts, especially in this post-COVID environment on what these choice environments look like. And that's something you know, definitely to think about contributing to. It's possible that this trend will spread to other countries. We are seeing remarkably rapid growth over this time. It's kind of harder to tell post-COVID. So we don't have a lot of post-COVID information. And if you want, you can read more about the context in various papers describing this education system in these hyperlinks. So I've given you three hyperlinks. Feel free to look through them, read them. These are you know, descriptive papers about the context. So what are education markets? Education markets are characterized by multiple schools within the same geographical area who differ in their characteristics. <clears throat> Consumers choose based on these characteristics, leading to an allocation of market share among schools. And then one set of big questions we're interested in is the following, which is, do these schools differ you know, we're interested in test scores. We want to know how much children learn. We want to know within these geographical areas, are these schools different? More specifically, do these schools differ in test score based quality? And if so, how significant are these differences? And do parents react to these differences? Okay, that's what I'm going to do in for the next 20 minutes, because if the answer to each of these questions is yes, then it is likely that schools' investments in quality reflect their strategic positioning in the market. We will be able to say, well, parents really care about this test scores. They care about what the schools are offering. Therefore, schools likely have to choose what they're doing. And that gives us an inroad into thinking about how to link economic models in, in the field of industrial organization to education. Okay. So we're gonna investigate these questions in the LEAPS data following a recent paper written by myself, Asim uh, Khwaja, Natalie Bao and Tahir Andrabi. There's a reason this doesn't have a hyperlink. It's because we are finalizing some final parts. And by late May, um, when the paper is in the public domain, I will put that hyperlink in an updated slide. So what data do we use? We're gonna use data collected as part of the LEAPS project yearly between 2003 and 2006. The sample of villages is restricted to those with at least one private school and about 70% of rural Punjab lives in villages like this. And then we're gonna use an additional year of data collected in 2011. And you'll see why that will turn out to be quite important. We're going to survey all the schools in these villages every year. Uh, that's more than 800 schools in these 112 villages. Think about how choice rich that environment is. We'll have a lot of data on these schools. Importantly, we'll also have data on children as they move between schools. Right? You'll see why that's important. And then we have test scores. The test scores retested children themselves. Uh, there were third graders in 2003-04 and a new cohort of third graders in 2005-06. We are following them for four years and we have yearly tests in math, in English, and in Urdu. We have some civic scores in 2004. Uh, and what these test scores show is they're generally consistent with low levels of learning, but growth over time. Asim will show you what these low levels of learning mean. I am going to talk here about the variation in learning across schools, across children. Uh, in case you want to read more about this, there is a paper, it's published, and you have a hyperlink in the previous part of the slides. Okay, first issue, how do we define school quality? What's a good school? We're going to use a measure called school value added as a measure of test score based quality. And we're going to define it very simply. 
We're going to say, let's define school value added as the increase in test scores that a randomly selected child will experience in the school. And we're going to have a standard problem. You know, imagine there are two schools and the children who learn faster go to school A and others go to school B. Then what we're going to see is that the test scores are going, are, are rising faster in school A, but in fact, this reflects the student body and not how good the school is, right? The proposed solution is always to use, in these cases, these value added modelings, is to use a rich set of controls over past test scores to eliminate the sorting, perhaps, right? But then you have to go back and validate it. So what we'll do is devise validation tests to show you that the school value added is actually a reasonable measure of school quality defined in this particular way, right? So I'm going to go now for you know, 15 minutes on this and then we'll return for a round of questions uh, uh, that have come up on this on this issue. Okay, so school value added again to remind you is the increase in test scores that a randomly selected child will experience in a given school, and the key estimating equation is this. So I'm going to have a child's test scores. The student is I, the grade is G, so they could be in grade three or grade four. The school is school S and T is the year, right? I'm gonna condition on their lag test scores, some grade fixed effects because maybe children learn differently in different grades, some time fixed effects, and then the school fixed effect, which is here, sorry, the school fixed effect. And the school fixed effect is telling us how much extra do children children uh, learn in this school compared to another school, right? And this alpha S, the school fixed effect or SVA, it's unbiased as long as sorting into school is not related to unobserved student characteristics, right? Conditional on all the controls we have. Then you have to do some extra work when you're trying to look at the variation in, in school value added. It's a technical aside you know, but just something there so that in case you want to look at it, you can Google empirical Bayes and see what this does. Question is, we do this process, how do we know that our estimates are valid? Well, we want to do the following. We want to say, you know, suppose we, our estimates were valid, then if I put a random child into that school, I shouldn't have to know the child's test score before and after joining that school. I should be able to predict the child's test score just by knowing the SVA of the school they have joined. So if the SVA of the school they have joined is plus one, I should see an increase in the child's test score of plus one. And I can compare this plus one with the test score of the child before and after, right? So maybe before it was in standard deviations, minus 0.3, after it became plus 0.6, the change is plus 0.9. Is that statistically equivalent to this plus one? Okay. This is why we need these children who are switching schools to look at this, this, this number. We can do more complicated tests, which we actually do in the, uh, 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 in, the, in the accompanying paper. These are pretty technical. I'm not going to go over them in, in the uh, presentation, but they're there for you to look at. Uh, and there are questions about, um, you know, maybe the school value added is unbiased, a forecast unbiased on average, but they're not good for each school. So let me show you this incredible graph. So if our estimates of the school value added are forecast unbiased, we should be able to predict how much a child will gain or lose if they switch schools by comparing the SP of the school they joined and the school they left. 
So we're going to look at the test score gains of children who switch, regressed against their predicted gain from the school value added estimates that we have created. And here's what it looks like. Before they switch, there is no information. It doesn't matter what school they're going to. It's not the case that children who were gaining a lot were the ones who switched to high SEA schools or the children who were losing a lot switched to low SEA schools, right? So before, before the switch, the coefficient is zero. Exactly at the time of the switch, the coefficient jumps to one. What does that one mean? It says the change in the test score of the child is equal to the SVA of the school with the coefficient beta equal to one. So we can predict perfectly how much the child will gain in their scores just by looking at the SVA of the school that they move to. We do more technical work here on, on trying to see whether uh, this survives the number of additional tests proposed by Josh Angrist and others in 2017. And it turns out all of this works fairly well in the LEAPS data. I will leave you to look at this uh, uh, whenever you have time and also look at the original paper. It's a beautiful paper and, and uh, uh, worth thinking about if this is something you're interested in. Okay, so what are the results? First, there is massive variation in school quality, right? So attending a one standard deviation better private school increases mean test scores by 0.21 standard deviations, right? Now, here's the interesting thing. We think about public schools, you know, there's a literature that thinks are private schools better or public schools better? Well, the answer is there are good public schools and bad public schools and good private schools and worse private schools, right? The interesting part is the variation in public schools is actually higher. So if you, I, we have plotted these histograms here. And if you look at the histogram for public schools, it shifted to the left. Yes, the mean is shifted to the left. But the really interesting part is that this variation in these public schools is much higher than the variation in private. Right? Where is that coming? So, so, you know, you could tell me, well, look, Jishnu, that, that's interesting that there's so much variation, but why would I care about it if this is across villages? Yes, I, I understand that, you know, uh, uh, there are some villages that have very bad schools and some villages that have good schools. And, and I, I tell you, you're wrong. That's not where all this variation is coming from. 45% of this variation is what you're talking about across villages but more than half is within villages. How have we tried to show that? So what I've drawn here is, is all 112 villages in leaps. And how are they ordered? They're ordered in increasing order of the average SVA in the village. And so you see this, you see that the best village has an average SVA here, the lowest village has an average SVA here. The point I want to make is even if you're in the worst village, your best school is very close to the average in the sample, right? And even if you're, you know, maybe not the top, but if you're, even if you're in the second best village, your worst school is lower than the average in the sample. In fact, you know, if you connect these, it's quite incredible that the third best village has a school that is equally bad or good as the worst village in the LEAP sample. So every village, it's not every village has great schools and bad schools. It's that every village has substantial variation in schooling. And now we can think about, okay, what does that mean by public private? Here's the fascinating part. There's a lot of variation within sectors. So interestingly, the best, and here again, we've put the 112 villages, the pink here or the red, is public schools and the blacks are private school. And this time it's arranged in order of SVA in public schools, right? Just to make it visually easier to see. So you see that this average SVA, the pink SVA is going up 
over, over this uh, uh, scale, which says there's some villages where the SVA of public schools is very high, somewhere it's low. But again, the interesting part is twofold. The best performing schools are both public and private, right? I mean, here are great public schools. They're in the top 1%, top 2%. Here are great public private schools, right? The worst performing schools are all public except for this one exception here, right? And now look at this, even in the schools, you know, there are a couple of villages that are exceptions, but even in schools where there are bad public schools, there are always good public schools, right? In fact, say this village here, which has probably the worst public school in our entire sample, it also has a public school that's really good. Right, or this village here. It has a school that's public school that's close to the top 10%. So the, the, the point that I want to try and make is this SVA shows you that we are not in an environment with a single school. We're in an environment where there are multiple schools, even within the same village. So forget cities, probably most of you are living in cities, go around your house and just look at how many different types of schools there are, how many different offerings there are, and realize that our education lens now has to realize that we are not living in a world with single schools. We are living in a world with substantial choice. Why does this matter? Well, let's think about one simple, one very simple uh, uh, question that people have been interested in for a while now on private school effectiveness, and people try and say, are private schools more or less effective? The answer is, it's complicated because of the following. Let's go back to the village. This is the village you have seen before. And I've just put some dummy numbers that kind of look like the graph I put up. Right? So imagine this government school is really good. It has a quality of 10. And this government school is really bad. It has a quality of 4. And similarly, they're good and bad private schools. Well, what's the private school effect? It depends. If I compare this private school with this government school, the private school effect is zero. But if I compare this private school to this government school, the private school effect is plus six. If I compare this private school with this private school, the private school effect is plus eight. So there's never going to be a single private school effect. There are going to be distributions of private school effect that reflect the difference, the distribution of school value added and the specific reallocation I'm thinking about. What do I mean by that? Well, let's consider policies that reallocate children from public to private schools within the same village, right? Depending on how the policy reallocates children, we can get very different causal treatment effects of private school effectiveness due to treatment heterogeneity. And I've drawn these. So I've said, look, let's consider moving children from all the public schools to the best private schools. Right? What happens? Well, some of these children will come from really good public schools. Right? And in fact, at the 10th percentile, our effects are negative. The mean is positive and about 0.25 standard deviations, but some children will suffer even with this policy. And some children will see great gains because they're moving from terrible public to the best private school. Alternatively, think about moving children from a, all the public schools to the worst private schools. In this case, the mean effects are very small a sizable proportion of children are going to do worse because there are good public schools that are better than the worst private schools. And some children will experience substantial gains because they're also really bad public schools that are worse than the worst private school, right? The mean is the average. So this is what we, have, we talk about with the mean. And the P90 and the P, uh, P10 are these percentiles depending on what school you moved from. Right? So then you would say, well, but what, all I've seen in the literature are these average estimates. What are those? 
Well, those average estimates combines this distribution of school value added with a specific reallocation of children across schools. Those are the weights. Okay. Uh, in the paper that unfortunately we don't have the link yet, but you will in May, we evaluate three such estimators and we show that in the LEAPS data, the average estimates from these estimators, there's nothing called an average estimate independent of the estimator you're using, ranges from 0.15 standard deviations to 0 0.30 standard deviations. What does that mean? Well, practically it means that when children move, we never see them move from a well-performing and free public school to a poorly performing and fee charging private school. And that's exactly what you'd expect. You would not expect children to give up a great and free public school to move to a poorly performing and expensive private school. Okay. Let me give you two more slides and then we'll stop for questions. Now, we've come to this point and we say, okay, these schools all differ in quality. These are pretty complex landscapes. Um, maybe they differ in quality in the same way that people differ in, in some characteristic that they don't control. Right? Maybe they just arise naturally as different schools. The question you can ask is, well, do parents respond to the fact that these are different types of quality schools? And the answer in the LEAPS data turns out to be very interesting. So if parents respond to school value added, we should see some relationship between school value added and prices in private schools. Imagine that there are two schools, one that has low school value added, one that is high. You know, I would, and we'll see this in the theory, I am willing to pay more for that high school value added school if that is what I'm concerned about. And that's actually true. So what have we drawn here? I've drawn for you the prices, the fees in these private schools this is with district fixed effects, and this is with village fixed effects. So it's within the same village, right? And you find very strong, significant correlations that actually explain almost half the fee variation in our, in our, in our, in our sample, right? And it says, and think about, you know, return to the fees that we had seen earlier. It was in the range of 400 to 800. And this is saying if you move up by one standard deviation, you can pull your fees up by 830 rupees. That's a lot, right? If you move across this range, you know, schools are pulling up their fee from 1,200 or so to about 1,600. These are huge improvements in their daily fee intake, right? Second slide, what about enrollment? Well, interestingly, for the private schools, we again find that schools that are higher school value added have higher enrollment. For public schools, we don't see that. And that's really interesting because it's saying despite the fact that public schools are free, it's not the case that parents are choosing higher quality public schools to go to. Right? Now, what do you see over time? And this is where this 2011 data I had talked about comes into play. But you see four things. First of all, you see that over eight years, the schools that had higher SVA also gained market share. Right? So the schools that had higher SVA are becoming bigger. Second, their test scores are stable. Right? So the SVA between 2003 and six predicts the test scores in 2011 quite strongly. And that's fascinating because almost 80%, well, actually 95% of teachers in the private schools have turned over. So it's saying despite total churn in your schooling, in your teachers, school owners are choosing to maintain the SVA that they have, right? Third, schools that are higher SVA are much less likely to close down. So over this time, 15% of schools shut down. But if you were better, if you were one standard deviation better, your likelihood of shutting down became zero, right? Very interestingly, this is different across private and public schools. So in private schools, the market share argument is stronger. The stability is higher, 
despite the fact that 95% of teachers are churning and your closure rates are significantly lower if you're good. For public schools, again, we do find that better public schools are, are, are uh, better public schools are, are uh, gaining market share over this time. We also find that they're remaining stable. So this is super interesting. Good public schools somehow, despite the fact that 50% of teachers are churning over, are able to maintain that quality over time. Interestingly, during this time, there's a school consolidation program that shuts down public schools. And what do we find? Well, they don't shut down the high quality public schools because they actually don't know which ones are high quality. They decided to shut them down based on enrollment. And one of the really surprising things we found was that enrollment is not correlated with SVA in the public schools. So let me summarize here and take some questions. So SVA can be feasibly computed in our context. Second big thing I want you to take away is there are large variations across schools in SVA. And half this variation is within village and market and within sector. There are good and bad public and private schools in every village. This implies feasible choice. Parents now have to make active decisions of where to enroll their children, how far to send them, how much to pay. And in making these choices, parents seem to care enormously about school value added in the private sector. Curiously, the evidence that they factor school value added in the public sector into their decisions is weak in these data. Now you might say, oh, that's really weird. You know, the interesting part of this is this, which is this is the first evidence we have on parents caring about SVA. In the United States, there's wonderful work by Parag Pathak, Josh Andrist, and others. And in Romania, there's wonderful work by Miguel Ukiola, uh, 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 Christian Pop Elishis at, at Columbia, showing that parents care about selectivity of the school, but not necessarily the SVA, right? So at the minimum, what this implies is that we can think of private schools as making strategic quality choices to position themselves in the market. So let me stop, stop there uh, you know, uh, uh, and see what kind of questions we have and, and, and you know, what we can, um, um, uh, what we think about that, right? So uh, let me, you know, um, uh, talk about three big issues that have arisen um, um, in, in this chat and we'll think through them. Um, one is, you know, Rashmi asks this question of have schooling markets thrived or declined during the last two years? You know, Rashmi, that's a fascinating question and I hope that it's something we can get into uh, in the uh, uh, in the in future research, but that's something you have to think about. All of us who are working on education are going to be affected by COVID. The short answer is I don't know, right? The reports we are receiving from the field is that the private schools have really taken a hit, and they're going to be you know given the enrollment of thirty percent, they're going to be a huge part of the recovery from COVID. But we don't know what's happened to them, so you know. Take it on yourself to say, you know, create a website, crowdsource the information. We need that information now because these children have really suffered uh, 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 during, during COVID. Okay. Uh, there's a question here on, on does the unbiasedness of SPA mean there's no selection of fast learning into better schools? Or does it mean that the selection bias was controlled for in some way in the forecast? And this is Jose Pinilla asked this question. The answer is the latter, which is it is the dense controls on past test scores that allows us to control for the sorting of children into schools. 
And one evidence, Jose, both from the teacher value-added literature and the school value-added, which, you know, as economists and econometricians, we are always concerned about selection and we're skeptical. It actually turns out that now for both teacher value-added and school value-added, these past test score controls are doing a fairly good job of, a very good job of controlling for selection. Uh, then, um, um, you know, uh, both uh, um, Carolina Sanchez and Mariel ask about, uh, can parents figure out which schools have high SDA within the village and how to make parents who need to send their kids to public schools understand uh, uh, SDA? The answer here is we will have to wait till the next lecture because Asim will talk precisely about how parents have information, what information they have and what information they are lacking. Uh, so let me, uh, finally, Mayank Dixit asks, is there an interaction between SV and child ability? That is better child and better school gives better results combined than individually. Mayank, the answer here is so far, the heterogeneity in SBA. So you're asking, can that SBA differ by child characteristics? And that's a completely legitimate question. And I think that's going to be the second stage of this research. So definitely a big area to push for this research is do different schools gain differently? And I'll point you to one very important paper by Natalie Bao that is forthcoming in the Journal of Political Economy uh, or JPE where she looks at the LEAPS data and she shows that schools track. So one of the very important things we learned from Esther's lecture was, you know, you have to think about teaching children where they are. Uh, but what she shows in the LEAPS data is schools actually choose to position who they're teaching to, right? Are they teaching to very high ability children or low ability children? And it's a fascinating paper that shows that when private schools enter the LEAPS market, existing private schools start to increase their instructional value, instructional level leading to welfare losses in this market. So a very nice question. And it is an actually one of those questions, Mike, fortunately we have a very good answer to, which is this paper by Natalie and which I will then put in the, the revised slides uh, 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 for you to think about. Okay, uh, so what are we going to do next? We have half an hour and I want to spend 15 minutes on presenting to you a little bit of a model, right? And in this model, we're going to think of schools choosing their strategic investments in quality. And then we're going to end with thinking about well, if schools are choosing their quality strategically, what are the implications of this way of thinking for how government should invest in public schools? Okay. So why are we doing theory? Why are we doing theory? The theory, it turns out, is going to provide us a structured way to think of this education market and educational decisions among parents and schools. Right? And I want to be careful, you know, look, models can provide a key intuition to take to the data or illustrate processes and channels that we need to pay attention to in understanding data and policy, even if we are not testing the model per se. And that's the flavor I want to give you here. So I'm going to sketch models of how schools might make decisions. And in these models, parents are going to choose among schools with different characteristics and schools have to choose how to respond to those demands. Here's the central intuition. The central intuition is, imagine two schools that are offering exactly the same thing, They're exactly the same thing. They're located right on top of each other and they're offering exactly the same thing. Well, can they charge different prices? No, they can't because if they charge different prices, then because they're exactly the same, it's a red apple and a red apple, everybody will choose the less expensive red apple. And the more expensive red apple won't have any consumers, right? In fact, that's what's called 
in, in, in game theory, that is what's called a Bertrand equilibrium. And the central result is every school is going to make zero profits. But now think about this. If they can differentiate themselves from each other, if one can say, hey, I'm high quality. The other says, hey, I'm low quality, right? Then they can charge different prices and still have positive demand. So the reason why you're going to see differentials in quality, differentials in how schools offer products is because it gives them what we call market power and that allows them to avoid the Bertrand equilibrium where profits are zero. Generally, in the way these models are constructed, we think of two types of differentiation, horizontal or vertical. So let me just give you some basic idea of what the key point is. And then we're actually going to solve a little bit of a model so that you can see how that's done and then we finish up. So in the classic hoteling model of ice cream sellers, you might have heard about this, right? I mean, so, so in the model of ice cream sellers, there's a big street there are two ice cream sellers. Uh, my grandfather on my mother's side was actually an ice cream seller. So I actually know this market a little bit. And their prices are fixed. So this guy charges $1. Uh, this guy charges $1. And they have to choose where to locate. The basic result is they're going to locate exactly in the center. Why are they going to locate exactly in the center? Well, if this person moves here while the other person's in the center, they just lose customers because all these guys are going to go to this person. This person is going to get fewer customers. He's going to get these many. So they both locate in the center. The reason this is so is because I fixed the price. Right? Allowing them to set a price sets off a trade-off. What's that trade-off? Well, the trade-off is that if I locate closer to my competitor, I'll get more consumers, but the price competition is going to become severe. So I have to say, should I move further away from my competitors and soften the price competition or but potentially lose consumers? And we're going to think about differentiation in two different ways. We're going to think about horizontal differentiation which is even if the two schools have the same price, they are different in a way that different consumers will choose different schools. For instance, maybe one school is in our country's English medium and another is Urdu medium. Maybe one offers arts and another offers computers, right? Then the people who like Urdu medium schools will go to Urdu medium. The people who like computers will go to computers. Uh, others may go somewhere else, right? So even if the two schools have charged the same price, they still have positive demand. With vertical, think about it as quality, right? If they charge the same price, then everyone strictly prefers one school to the other. So one school is just better than the other. So think about it as a Mercedes and a lower quality car, right? Uh, if the price is the same, everybody is going to buy the Mercedes, okay? Let me show you a, a basic, this is a technical slide, but I think it's useful to know how to solve, you know, the basic intuition between solving these models and the technique, which is always the same. So let's think about two firms producing quality A1 and A2, and A2 is bigger than A1, and it costs them C to produce each unit of quality. So this is the, mar each unit of the good. That's the margin of cost. And they're buyers. Buyers have a willingness to pay theta i. Right? Theta i is distributed uniformly on zero one, which means there are some consumers sitting at zero, there's some consumers sitting at one, and the distribution is uniform. There are exactly as many customers at every point on this distribution. And then I'm going to have a utility function for these guys which is very simple, which says it's your valuation of the quality of the school. So that's A theta I minus the cost of the school. So if you're a high theta I, so imagine your theta I was one, 
Well, you're going to buy all the way to the point that A is greater than B. You're going to get positive VI. But imagine your theta is zero, then the only reason you'll buy is if P is zero, right? So high theta I are people who really like quality, who value quality. Low theta I are people who don't. That's your first kind of setup in these models, right? Second part of the setup, so how do you solve these models? Well, you first ask, given A1 and A2, how are these firms going to price, right? So we draw this line and we ask, who is the consumer who's indifferent between buying from A1 and buying from A2, wherever they are. So maybe A1 is here and maybe A2 is here, right? Well, it's somebody whose utility must be the same whether they buy from A1 or they buy from A2. Let's call this person theta star, but then it has to be that their utility from A1, right? So theta star, which is equal to A1 theta star minus P1 is going to be equal to their utility from buying from theta from, from A2, which is equal to A2 theta star minus P. But you could solve that and you'll get the indifferent consumer is going to be located at P2 minus P1 over A2 minus A1. Why does this matter? And surprisingly, we are almost done. This matters because we now know that anybody who's on the left of this number is going to buy from A1, and anybody who's on the right of this number is going to buy from A2. So we now have the demands for these guys. What are the demands? Well, given that this is uniform, the demand for A1 is just P2 minus P1 divided by A2 minus A1. The demand for two is just one minus that, right? You can then maximize profits. So what are profits? Well, for each person I sell to, I'm going to get PI. So for person one, P1 minus C, that's my price, that's my marginal cost multiplied by my demand. Right? That's my profits. I can maximize that with respect to P1 and set it equal to zero. And I'm going to get this function for what my P1 is, this function for what P2 is. Last step, and then we are done. I promise. Last step is these are best response functions. This is saying if P2 is say three, and C is two, then I should charge as P1, I will charge three plus two is five divided by two, 2.5, right? Similarly, P2 is making a calculation. Well, what's the equilibrium, right? This is game theory. The equilibrium is, the equilibrium is a point where whatever P2 star is chosen gives me a P1 star, and at that P1 star, the optimal response of two is actually P2 star. How do we solve that? We're very simple. We just have two equations, two unknowns. We are just going to replace the P2 here with the, uh, uh, with the equation of P2 from the other uh, maximization. If we do this, we are going to get exact solutions in this case, which gives me a P2 and a P1. Right? And these make sense. I mean, if you stare at it, it'll make sense, right? It's just saying, you know, P2, this is my marginal cost, and this is my profit. This is my markup, sorry, right? So in fact, unlike the Bertrand, I am earning a positive profit because I have differentiated myself from the other person. How much am I earning? Well, here's the interesting thing the more I differentiate myself, the more profit I'm going to earn. So imagine now we go back and say, where should these firms locate, right? So we can compute their profits and you immediately see that I'm going to try and maximize A2 minus A1 to get the maximal possible profit, whether I'm firm one or firm two. 
Fascinating result, right? Both these firms are ex ante identical. Both of them have a marginal cost of C. They are going to now locate to maximize their profits. They are going to locate at entirely different points at the ends of the distributions. It's an asymmetric Nash where one person is going to get less profit than the other, but both are going to get positive profits. How fascinating is that? We took the hoteling model where the profits are zero and everybody is located in the center. And we said, let firms charge their own prices, let them choose their own quality. And immediately we have moved to a situation where both of them are going to earn positive profits. And now both of them are located at the ends of the distribution. Right? So high quality firm charges higher prices earns greater profits, which is increasing in product differentiation. I had put a blank slide for the math, but uh, that's something you should use. Uh, so, you know, so we did this. Now, this is an incredible result as both firms have the same marginal cost. So as long as the products are highly differentiated in quality, firms can charge prices above markup. If their quality levels come too close, then price competition increases decreasing the profits. Now, these models are sensitive, right? They're sensitive to assumptions regarding entry. They're sensitive to assumptions of the distribution of willingness to pay, the exact cost structure, with the basic intuition that firms differentiate themselves in order to gain market power remains the driving force behind each of these models. I've also solved one with horizontal differentiation where the, the functions are going to be a little different. You can work through it at your leisure. The steps are the same, locate the indifferent consumer, figure out the demands for the two firms, optimize for the prices, figure out that gives you the best response, solve for the Nash, okay? And I've given you some questions here that just help you, you know, kind of work out, did you actually get the, the, the intuition that you needed? Okay, so we have actually developed a set of simulations to guide you through some of these models. And this has been done with Gabriel Vassi. Uh, and you will see the, sorry, this, uh, hopefully you now see a screen uh, uh, that is different from my PowerPoint. Uh, and this is, you know, we have set up a model of product differentiation with both vertical and horizontal differentiation. This is this here is is the uh, this over here is the uh, utility function we talked about. You can choose a sample size. You can choose a distribution of willingness to pay. You can choose. You can then look at the household's choice, given a public school quality, a private school quality, a private school price. The difference here is we don't have two firms choosing quality. You know, you are choosing the public school quality. Right, just to keep it easy. And then interestingly, let me just show you a couple of things. You know, think about these different graphs. So the one on the left here is how many people are attending private school as their quality goes up. This shows you their costs and their revenues. And this shows the private school price and what happens at different prices. So for example, you know, if my public school quality is really low, you can see that the private school is gonna maximize its profits, you know, it'll charge a really, I think it'll charge a really high price uh, 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 and get very high profits. Uh, but as the public school quality goes up, so if the public school quality is something like eight, right, you start to see that it's very hard. The private school will have to lower its, its, its profits. Well, at a price of seven, it can never make profits. As it pushes up the price, maybe it can make some profit somewhere, right? But in general, it'll have to push its quality up quite a bit, right? So you can play around with this. And what we have tried to show here is as the quality of the public school increases, you get fairly complicated things happening. So the private school has to increase its quality. Its price will first decline and then go up. But at some level of the quality of the public school, the whole thing just collapses. The private school can't 
do any more. It can't increase its quality further. It's going to make negative profits and it's going to shut down. Okay. So play around with this. The link is on your site and you'll develop a lot of intuition for how these models work. But let me now show you kind of, let me spend maybe five, seven minutes more on some empirical implications of the model. And then kind of, we can spend five, seven minutes on questions that, that remain. So one implication of the model is that now public sector investments must account for how parents react to these investments and how schools react to these investments. You know, so often I get this question, oh, are you guys talking about policies for private schools? And we're saying, no. A fundamental change you have to make due to the recognition that most children are now being educated in schooling markets is that there's really no difference between policies towards public schools and policies towards private schools. At best, these are indicative of the site where the policy is being implicated or implemented, but the ramifications of each of these policies will be sector wide. Then I'm going to discuss each of these shortly, but not in detail. Let me give you one example. How does household demand affect policies like vouchers? So, you know, what a voucher is, 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 uh, is I'm going to give you money from the public sector to attend a private school. Think about school vouchers in Pakistan. The premise was that private schools are better, but many parents cannot afford them. Therefore, giving them subsidies to attend private schools through vouchers will improve test scores. What's the assumption? Private schools are better. We saw that's not necessarily true. There's a whole number of private schools and public schools. Parents cannot afford them. There was no evidence at the time of the policy. And private schools will continue to be better once subsidies come in. We don't know, right? But let me focus on one key issue of whether parents can afford private schools. And I'll tell you why this is important. You know, imagine the current situation is that there are 100 children in private schools, right? And we say, you know, if we give vouchers of $10, 200 will come in. You can make the following calculation. You can say, look, the total spend is, sorry, is, is $3,000, not $300, right? And the increase in enrollment is $200. So the cost is $15 per additional child enrolled. And we say off this amount, $1,000 or 33% is what we call inframarginal, which is these were children who were going to private schools in any way, but now you have made it free for them with $10. You know, it's not a bad thing, right? I mean, the welfare effects are totally different because at some level, if there's no market failure, cash is the best thing to do. But an alternate scenario might be we have 100 children in private schools and only 10 come in with the voucher. Well, then your inframarginal subsidy is 90%. And in terms of policy, you may not be happy about that because you might say, look, these children who are in private schools anyway are already quite rich and we don't need to subsidize them. Right? So a lot is going to depend upon when you lower the price, how many more kids are going to come into school. Right? So the paper that does this and it's linked is my paper with Pedro Carnero and Hugo Ries in the LEAPS data where we estimate the demand elasticity for private schooling. And we show that the own price elasticities are minus 1.12 for girls, minus 0.37 for boys, which are pretty low. And these reflect the change in demand when a single school increases its price. The sectoral price elasticities would reflect the increase in demand from a reduction in the price of all private schools are minus 0.27 and minus 0 0.10, which means if they decrease their price by 10%, right, you will get a 1% increase in demand. Okay, So then you can calculate what are the changes in total school enrollment, in private school enrollment, and in public school enrollment from vouchers that lower the price to zero. And what you find is, yes, you're going to get more kids coming into school, right, particularly girls, but these are not earth-shaking numbers. And in fact, it's closer to our second example where you know, these are going to have big uh, inframarginal subsidies going to children who were already in private schools. Right? And in fact, that's been the experience in Pakistan. 
There are not 2 million or more plus children in voucher schools. There's been no change in private school enrollment trends. So most of this money has actually gone to children who were going to go to private schools in any case. Okay, let me finish with one last example and then we are done. You know, uh, I want to introduce this last idea of what do schooling markets imply for public sector investments? So one key message from this research is that everything is interconnected. So if you want to study the impact of public sector investments, we have to look at both the school that received the investment as well as others in the same market. The key problem with these kinds of studies is that when children move across schools, it's going to be very difficult to separate the school from the household responses. Are we seeing higher test scores with public investments in school A because of the investments or because the composition of children changed? The LEAP setting allows us to use a unique strategy of what we call market level randomization. And Asim will discuss this tomorrow in some detail that allows us to answer these questions in an empirically rigorous manner. And so I discuss briefly this paper and then we'll call it a day. What is our technique? Our technique is take the leaps villages. This is now a village you should be very familiar with. Note that because of the fields around it, children go to the schools in the villages and schools in the villages get their children from the village. Right? Put in a new program in some villages, but not in others. And then come back and look at everything. Look at whether schools closed down, look at whether more children had higher test scores, look at, you know, uh, did some schools do a lot better? Each of those in the aggregate reflects your treatment effect because we have randomized the treatment at the village level, not at the school level. Okay, very quickly, we do this experiment where we give grants to public schools. You know, this is just one of those timelines where this is a long study from 2003 to 2011. What do we find? You know, yes, the grants went to these schools. You know, I'm gonna rush through these. Uh, there was a sizable amount. Interestingly, at the village level, big increases in test scores, right? So that's for the full village, so there's no sorting. And very interestingly, a big increase in private school test scores in addition to the increase in public school test scores. Why? Because private schools have to respond because otherwise they're going to lose enrollment to the public schools, right? In fact, we show that if you don't account for the private school spillovers, your cost effectiveness was 1.18 Tesco standard deviation per additional 100 USD. With the spillover, it's 2.1. So you're underestimating your cost effectiveness by 46% if you're not taking into account these spillovers. Is that going to be true everywhere? No. In the simulations, which you should play around with, it's very clear that if the public school quality increases are very large, the private school will shut down. I mean, they can't compete or at the very least will lose significant market share. And the two papers that I've hyperlinked here by Dynastine and Smith, as well as Nielsen, Dynastine and Otero, who show both in New York City and in Dominican Republic, uh, uh, this kind of responses. So in, in New York City, an increase in grants to public schools led to children leaving private schools to attend public schools. And in the second case, a massive expansion, 4% of GDP in public school capacity led to the closure of private schools. So, whether it's socially beneficial or not depends on multiple factors. But what I want you to take away from here is the moment you're in education markets, it's one of those things, once you see it, you can't unsee it, right? The moment you realize the education markets, there's no private school policy, public school policy. Any policy is going to affect the entire market. So let me conclude, you know, the world of schools is gonna look very different pre-COVID from a version where there's one school and the only, and look very different, at least in pre-COVID times, from a version where there's one school and the only choice that children make is to attend or not attend. Now, many children live in areas with significant and real choice and schools are reacting to what parents and children want. So this implies that we need to actually shift our thinking from focusing on individual schools to focusing on markets. What I've shown here is that a key measure of quality can be feasibly measured and is valid. 
And once you do this measurements, they reveal substantial variation within market and sector. And I've also shown that parents react to this variation. Because parents care about this, it's going to have implications for key policies like vouchers and public sector investments. And in the next lecture, Asim will take you through how we can improve market functioning and solve this productivity challenge that I posed right at the beginning. You've been a great, uh, 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 you know, that's, so officially that's the end of the lecture. Let me maybe spend some time on, you know, what the questions have been, uh, 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 and then we can uh, conclude the lecture. So let me take on uh, some of the open questions. So Pradeep asks, there might be possibility of mutual collusion to maximize profit as we see in a typical duopoly market structure. Have you looked at it in the theory? Uh, Pradeep, part of it is we are very interested in, you know, as you know, the moment you depart from perfect competition, there are any number of models you might be interested in. And I think the key question is, how is that going to link up with your empirical work? So I think it's very interesting to look at collusion. On the other hand, we have to think about, okay, you can always merge schools, right? So without an industry structure, where do we care about collusion and how is it going to be important is a fascinating question. And the short answer we is we haven't looked at it and something you should think about. Great Tembo asks, how do you explain free education policy against quality provision for public schools? You know, uh, it again comes down to what are the price elasticities of schooling versus what is the what is the number on 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 quality. Uh, there's a very nice paper by Robert Garlick who looks at the free uh, schooling policy in South Africa and what that did, uh, and he has some very interesting observations on on price elasticities that uh, Tembo you might be interested in. And lastly, uh, Bitch. Uh, Tran asks, uh, private schools are usually small cost effectiveness and serve a certain purpose, at least in the case of the US. What is, the, what is it for the case of Pakistan? I also wonder if increasing in enrollment changes would change performance of private schools. Private schools are less efficient. Uh, Tran, I'm not sure that this is um, a universal answer to this is possible. Um, you know, interestingly, this idea of school size is a fascinating one and very different in low-income countries from what we usually think. Gita Kingdom has a really important paper uh, that just looks at schools in India and their sizes, and she shows something incredible. She shows that almost a third of public schools are smaller than 30 or 40 students. So we have to, this idea of cost effectiveness and size, that's something we really need to think about. And thank you for, for bringing this up. Did you, Padmaja asked, did you collect any data on after school tutoring? Yes, we did. Uh, we are working on that. Interestingly, in the early years of the leaps, there was almost no after school tutoring, at least till grade 10. Now it's really picked up a lot, even pre COVID. So, you know, things are changing on the ground on a you know, yearly basis. Um, and that's, that's important. Uh, uh, interestingly, you know, for this SVA calculations, it might be complicated if they're doing a lot of tutoring, but for the years 2003 to six, they're not. And finally, will this pandemic alter the education markets that is public private schools permanently? Fascinating question, uh, uh, Mayank, and something that we have to think about and look about. It's something we are all really concerned about because a sizable fraction of children are getting educated in the schools. And uh, uh, I think this is the one of the biggest research issues that we should be thinking about, that you should be thinking about uh, in this current environment. So let me stop there. You have been a wonderful and patient audience. Uh, and I hope that this was a useful lecture. Do come back and tune back in tomorrow for Asim's lecture on how we can improve schooling in, uh, in through the lens of education markets. And you'll see that it's a completely different take on how we can empower people locally to do the best that they can. Have a wonderful day. Enjoy the rest of uh, your you know, morning, afternoon, evening, wherever you are. And thank you again 
for tuning in and thank you to the organizers for this completely seamless experience. Goodbye.